The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. At that time, one of the multitude said to Jesus, Teacher, bid my brother divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of all covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grains and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid down for you for many years. Take it easy. Eat. Drink and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Lead questions for today. Question number one. What is the fundamental question raised by the author of Ecclesiastes in our first reading? What is the fundamental question that was raised in that reading, chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes? And as a Christian, what answer can you provide to that question? Remember the first reading? was a fundamental question that the author was dealing with. How, as a Christian, would you answer that question? Question two. The gospel challenges us Christians to adopt a certain attitude towards worldly riches or worldly success, or even to our life itself, our material life itself. What is this attitude? Question three. Why does St. Paul refer to greed and avarice as idolatry? Covetousness. Greed and avarice. It's equivalent to idolatry. The worship of false gods. Why do you think greed and avarice are equivalent to idolatry? Question four. Now, as we watch helplessly, I think that's the proper word, helplessly, we and our leaders, including security agencies, as we all watch helplessly Nigeria's economic, political, and security situation worsening, degenerating every day, and as terrorists threaten to invade the FCT, the very seat of government, what Christian virtues must we cultivate at this time? Message has even been sent to our president that they are coming to kidnap him. And we can see that they are carrying out their threats. They threatened to free their people in, in, in Kujie prison. They carried it out. 
They threatened president. They already started attacking the presidential guard and killing some of them. So the rest of us are, do I say the rest of us are helpless? All of us are helpless. As we watch helplessly Nigeria's economic, you said the, the, the dollar has reached 700 naira. Eh? So, economically, we are helpless. We watch our currency go down from 65 kobo to $1 in my lifetime. In my lifetime, it was 65 kobo. When Naira came, when, I, when, when we changed from pounds to Naira, was that 72 or 73? It was 65 kobo to $1. And when I went for studies in 1988, it was one naira to $1. And now we are told it's over 700 naira to $1. So we are watching helplessly and our currency is tumbling down to become like what Zimbabwe's currency used to be. We are watching helplessly. The economy worsening. Watching helplessly the politics worsening because today this country is more divided than ever before along religious lines, along ethnic lines. We are watching helplessly as security situation. In every estate now, they are having security meeting to re-strategize. And as terrorists threaten to evade FCT, and it's not just a threat, they are all around. What Christian virtues must we cultivate at this time? Mighty one, you are able. Jesus, you can do it. Mighty one, you are able. Oh Lord, save our land. Mighty one, you are able. Jesus, you can do it. Mighty one, you are able. Oh, Lord, save our land. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. Give it microphone. I want to attempt uh, question number two. Okay. It says the gospel challenges us Christians to adopt a certain attitude towards worldly riches through success. What is, the, what is this attitude? The attitude is detachment. The attitude is detachment. detachment. Okay. We, we have to detach ourselves from all the so-called riches of the world and focus on earthly things. Do you call them so-called? It's the riches of the world now. They're the riches of the world. Uh -huh. We employ them to strive towards heaven, which is the ultimate goal. We use them for higher purpose. Yes, Father. We don't treat them as goals in themselves. Yes. They are meant to be instruments for higher yeah. purpose. And what is that higher purpose? Heaven. Okay. Heaven. Give him a round of applause. So he says the attitude is detachment. Yes. Okay. I want to answer question one and add to question three. Mm -hmm. So the fundamental question raised by the author of Ecclesiastes in our first reading is what is the purpose of life? I give her a round of applause. 
The fundamental question raised by the author of Ecclesiastes is, what is the purpose of life? By the way, today is one of those few Sundays that every reading is the same topic. The same topic. Yeah. Every reading. First reading, responsorial psalm. Second reading, gospel. Exactly the same. It is the purpose of life. The fundamental question is, what is the purpose of life? So, what answer as a Christian will you provide? So as a Christian, I would um, turn to the Catechism book. The question, um, why did God make you? Is the answer to that question. Because if you are looking for the purpose of your life, it is the reason why God made you. So, God made me to know him, to love him, to serve him in this world, and to be happy with him in the next. So that's be, the purpose of my life. To love him, to be happy with him first in this world. In this world. And be and happy with him in, in the, the next. next. So the question that the author of Ecclesiastes that talks about vanity of vanities was dealing with is, what is the purpose of this life self? That some people make money, struggle to make money, and work hard and do extra job only for some idiots to come and the money he has worked for for 10 years they come and demand for, for, for ransom and he loses everything right yeah. that, that is even still less than or he suddenly dies and he doesn't know who I mean there are people who are building big, big houses hundreds of millions of houses that they don't know when they die, they can have one idiot child who, three months after, he has auctioned it. He has sold it in order to get money to, to, to buy his drugs. Eh? To feed his cocaine habit. I hope you know. Mm -hmm. So he spends his whole life working hard and then he's building house in the exclusive parts of town. And then Three months after, his idiot son decides that his cocaine hab habit, his cocaine addiction is more important than landed property. So he sells it in order to feed his uh, whatever. So the, he says, this herd of yours, who shall it be? Because when you die, are you still in control of who it shall be? You can write will as much as you want. But you do will for your son so that it can go from your uh, you can go from you to your son and from your son to his grandson and from your grandson to your great grandson. All that is vanity. Because it may not even do six months with your son. I keep telling people the discipline with which you acquire those things and maintain those same things, your son may not have that discipline. Just, just remember. Remember what I said before about, um, about living properties for children. The discipline with which you cultivated those things and acquired those things, you think that, do you transfer discipline by birth? Each one has to learn it. And learn it in a hard way. The suffering you suffered, when you walked, you trekked without shoes, like Jonathan, to school. When you trekked without shoes to school and you trekked five kilometers to school and then you got beaten 12 lashes of the cane each time you were late and you were trained with suffering then you started making money then you knew the value of money many of your children don't have that discipline they are aje butter aje sugar <laughs> They don't have that discipline. That time you used to put Gary in the pocket. <laughs> that is your own is better if there is palm kernel. <laughs> that time you used to put Gary in the pocket. And then when your classmates as in my own case, because my mother refused to give us money, not because she didn't have, she wanted to train us, refused to give us money to go to school. 
And then when our classmates are, are buying olele to eat, my my to eat, and then we will be going near and say, damn day, damn day, damn day. <laughs> now, with that training, if I begin to make money, I will know how to take care of the money. But if I now give birth to one uh, a je sugar, a je butter child, who never saw all that? Do you think he will know how to manage that money? No. That is why in organized places, what people do is set up a foundation to take care of their wealth rather than hand over to somebody that will destroy it. But the Bible is very clear about it. That you are not in control of what happens to your goods. Therefore, back to the detachment. Back to the purpose. That is what will make us to succeed in life. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> Obama, do you know what we are talking about? I'll give him. I'd like to answer question number four. You see yourself now. Shidebere, God's time. Uh, Virginius, and so as you people are not answering question four, see the person who is beginning to answer question four. Okay, let's hear you. As we watch helplessly Nigeria's economic, political, and security situation worsening daily, our self is threatening to invade FCT, the very seat of government. What Christian virtues must we cultivate at this time? One of the Christian virtues we must cultivate is hope. Hope. Mm. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> the virtue of hope is a Christian virtue we must cultivate at this time. At this time, we need what? Hope. Come and take hand. Thank you. No wonder you are relaxing like that. <laughs> yes, at the back. I would like to attempt uh, question four and add to no question two. The Christian virtue we need to cultivate at this time of this all this uh, insecurity and all this. Uh, is courage. Because each time Jesus meets his disciple in a frightening situation, he see courage. courage. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid for I have overcome the world. And sometimes even when Peter was walking to, the, to, 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 to meet Christ on the sea, because he take off his eyes from Christ, he began to sink. So sometimes when you take your eyes off God, then fear will not dominate you and begin to live in a frightening situation. So to that question too, I think one of the attitudes we have to possess in that situation is that when Christ met, went to the home of uh, Mary and Martha, he was saying one thing is needed and Mary has chosen that part, which is fix your eyes on God, be attentive to God and uh -huh. one thing is all this distraction going uh, is, is not needed. So and the second reading was telling us that we should fix our eyes on God, where Christ is seated. So that is a... Fix your eyes on the purpose, on the goal. They say begin with the end in view, right? Begin with the end in view. And what is the end? The goal, the purpose. Fix your eyes on the purpose of life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the rest will be added unto you as well. Seek ye first. Teacher, are you adding question four? Okay, quickly then. Oh, oh okay. A round of applause for him. Yeah, Father, I just wanted to add that um, I think that part of the reason that St. Paul referred to greed and avarice as idolatry is because it also robs us of our Christian virtues, especially the virtue of charity. 
So greed and avarice is idolatry because it robs us of our Christian life and our Christian virtues. So um, when you're focused on getting and focused on yourself and collecting, then you are not focused on giving. You're not focused on loving. You're not focused on all the, the virtues of Christianity. And so um, the false god, apart from the fact that you're worshiping a false god, it also means that your relationship with God and your, and your life, you know, um, is... Is, is not focused on the virtues of, of Christianity, but on what it is that you can get as opposed to what it is that you can give. Actually, in the, um, as we shall see, the sin of the rich man is not because he got a bumper harvest. Is it because he got a bumper harvest? No, I mean, it's just a wonderful thing that he got a bumper harvest. The sin of the rich man is that he focused only on himself. Okay. You remember this, my coffin, this photo? Nice coffin, nice looking coffin. Ebenezer, nice looking coffin. Ah, this one get polished, you know. <laughs> but my own will be cut and nailed. It's, uh, it's in my will. So even though my sister will not like it, but it's in my will, cut and nailed. Kohelet, the author of um, Ecclesiastes, deals with the fundamental question of the meaning of life or the purpose of human existence. What is the purpose of life with all its toil and sweat and eventual death at a time you do not know? What is the purpose of life? So this is what it deals with. With us human beings, the certainty of death is ever present. So wise persons do grapple with the question. You see, it is foolish people who live their life daily, gathering and gathering without thinking of these fundamental questions. Wise persons daily, as they wake up, they say, but what is the purpose? I mean, we keep telling people, you live your life, you wake up early, you wake up, you, you, you have breakfast, you go to work, you come back, you have dinner, you go to sleep, next day you wake up, you go to market, you buy goods, for what? A lot of human beings just float. You know, just float. And just keep doing those things without questions. But wise persons through the ages have constantly asked themselves. So, I get to age 25. I'm supposed to marry. For what? So, I marry. I'm supposed to have children. For what? I'm supposed to get work. And do, you see, do you know that the majority of people in, in the society, they just follow they just follow, follow. I hope you know. They say, I'm supposed to get a nice car. For what? They say, the basic small car is not enough for me. My colleagues are getting Jeep. So let me go and get Jeep. But for what? I'm supposed to live in some posh part of town because I am now an MD. Do you ask yourself, for what? The majority of human beings do not ask for what? They just do what others are doing. Sadly, Socrates says that a life not reflected upon is not worth living. Unfortunately, the majority of people, how does Professor Osui uh, say it? 99.999% of people are, are not aware. They are sleeping. Anthony de Mello says most human beings are sleepwalking. They were asleep when they were born. They had to beat them to cry because they were asleep. Then they are asleep as they go to school. Then they are asleep as they marry. Then they are asleep as they have children. Then they are asleep as they walk. And then they sleep into death, not aware. But people who are aware, like Kuhelet, ask the question, why do we have to die? Is death the end of everything? If we are born only to die, then why be born at all? What is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of human existence? These are serious questions that serious people do ask. For Kohelet, all of life and all of human accomplishments just don't make sense. It all amounts to vanity. Vanity means it's all empty. It's a breath that disappears immediately. Vanity, futility, emptiness. 
unless there is some purpose and meaning to it which transcends death. I mean, didn't St. Paul say, if our hope in Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if our hope, hope in Christ were for this world alone, then of all people we are to be most pitied. Unless there is some purpose that transcends death, this life makes no meaning. We just finished our psychotrauma healing and we had story after story after story of trauma. Right? Those of you who are there, story after story after story of trauma. Practically everyone, some 75, 80 people in the hall, everyone had some story of trauma. Pain, suffering, neglect, abuse. If there is no meaning beyond death, if there is no purpose beyond death, then what is all this about? Yet, Kuhelet appears not to be sure of what this purpose is. The human mind abhors mortality. The human mind abhors total destruction and annihilation. There is a profound longing deep inside each one of us for immortality to live forever. It's a profound longing to live forever. We know of death. And like I said here sometime, I say human beings, we all die. All creatures, all living creatures die. But the most distressful fact is that for human beings is that we are the ones who know from day one that we will die. And we live with that distress. So because we know we will die, and because we instinctively fight destruction and total annihilation, we do certain things. Impulsively, we seek to live on through what? Through procreation, through heredity. So the man who is building houses for his child, son and daughter and granddaughter and great-grand, is trying to live on. He's Perhaps his joy is that my great grandson will still be living in my house. Idiot. Which grandson will live in your house? Your house that you build with today's style. And you think your grand, great grandson will, will like that. He will bulldoze the thing. He will demolish the whole thing. Because there is that illusion, right? Chidebere. You think that, that your son will like that kind of uh, that ramshackle house you built which you and your wife are admiring as good as you think your son, your grandson. Your gra grandson will say, ah, ah, you mean people lived here? <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, it doesn't make sense to build houses for children and grandchildren. It doesn't make sense. Can you imagine the house you build, you spend five years building, going every time to go and inspect your project and everything. Can you imagine that three years after you are dead, it is bulldozed? That, that your own son, whom you handed it over to, decided to demolish it? Those of you, from, those of you who know Asokoro, the houses I met in Asokoro in 2008, more of half of them, 50% of them are gone. 50% of them are gone. Those that inherited them have demolished them. These are matchboxes. Demolish them and put new ones. Of their own style. Their own children will demolish their own and put their own style. So please don't spend too much on houses. Don't spend too much. Use that money to build a legacy in the hearts of people that will last forever. So people, people live on, they want to live on through procreation, through heredity, through achievements. You know, if, if, if achievements that I am chief, honorable, doctor, sir. <laughs> ah, you are the one who said Victor. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm not the one who said it too. For us Christians, however, Jesus' message of the resurrection and eternal life provides the best answers to this fundamental question. You understand? Are you getting the point? 
Kohelet did not appear to be very sure. But Jesus provides the answer with his message of the resurrection. Death for us is not the end, but a new beginning. Amen? Amen. A round of applause for Jesus. <laughs> Jesus has saved us from that terrible distress and frustration of emptiness, nihilism. I did it yesterday, yeah, I was talking about nihilism. That there is a proliferation, there is a there's preponderance of nihilism in today's world. The sense that nothing has meaning. Which is why there is an upsurge in suicide. Which is why so many people are on drugs. Which is why so many people are depressed. The sense that there is no sense in anything. The feeling that there is no sense behind all this. It's called nihilism. Jesus had just finished one of his teaching sessions one, when one man from the crowd came up and asked him to intervene in an inheritance claim with his brother. Their father didn't do proper will. Or if the, their father did the will, his, the senior brother didn't share with, you know, the, the senior brother is like from Benin. <laughs> Where is Solomon? The senior brother is like from Benin. They were in those days, so I don't know if they have changed it now. The, senior bro the first son inherits everything and can give some crumbs yeah. to the others if he likes. Hey, Solomon, I lie. Not be lie. <laughs> Not be lie. <laughs> <laughs> so his senior brother is from Benin and his senior brother didn't give him whatever. And then he said to Jesus, please tell my brother, tell my brother to give me my share of inheritance. And Jesus refused to be dragged into the controversy over material goods. No, that's not why I came to the world. Though. Instead, the answer Jesus gave is that, hey, 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 come. He turns to the man and to his others. Do not put your trust in material things or seeking meaning in worldly possessions. Then he wants all not to become prisoners of greed and slaves of acquisitiveness and endless ambition. You see, see what we do. Is that not how we see people coming from ShopRite? <laughs> that, man is from that, that, that man is from Boko. <laughs> <laughs> Idolatry is worship. That photo looks like recently in the Eagle Square, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Delegate. Eh? Delegate. Uh -huh. Delegate. Delegate were counting the thing. Yeah. Idolatry is worship of false gods. But these are not serious delegates. Serious delegates get it in dollars. This looks like Naira. Eh? After. No, but serious delegates got in dollars. Oh, okay. Share with people in their areas. Oh, okay. Those who facilitated, they are becoming delegates. Yes, Aha, okay. <laughs> Idolatry is worship of false gods. It consists in putting our trust or giving our life over to something or someone other than the almighty God. Greed and avarice and inordinate ambition for worldly power and security amount to idolatry, the worship of false gods. See Colossians chapter 3 verse 5. In Ephesians 5, 5. The rich man in Jesus' parable not only put his trust in his possessions, he was ready to use them exclusively. You take note of the word. Exclusively for his own benefit only. He says to himself, relax, take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. I mean, we are seeing that with a lot of so-called celebrities who make huge amounts of money, and the next day you hear that he bought one 100 million naira car. Uh, he gave his child an 80 million naira car, his child that is not yet able to drive car. That you hear that he bought a second private jet. I say, what? Does having plenty of money, does it make people run mad? Yes. Oh, it does. Yes. It makes people run mad. I mean, a lot of these people come from villages in Nigeria where people are still living in criminal destitution. And yet, some of them are even doing party 
inside private jet. It just makes people run mad, I think. In biblical terms, the selfish person, the one who cares for no one but himself alone, the one who sees no link between his fortunes and the fate and fortunes of others, that person is in fact dead. You are, you are a petty uh, young graduate in the village. And then you join the government day secondary school in your village. And you are being paid 25,000 naira. Look, me, I have this experience. So they were somebody, and he's being paid 25,000 naira. Then he begged, do and begged, and begged. Father George, get me, so help me get a job. Then I bring you to Lagos. And then you are teaching in a better school in Lagos where they are giving you 60,000 naira. Now, do you think that the person remembers his colleagues in the village? All he does is that he increases the quality of shoe he used to buy. If he used to buy bend down, he used to buy bend down, whatever, he has now raised his level to go to a better shop and buy. If he used to buy the, um, the, the shoes that they used to sell on the roadside, he has now increased whatever. Then he began to know people. And as he began to know people, he got into a bank. And then the first salary, 200,000. Ah. So he began to see the suit that his people of his level are wearing. Level has changed, isn't it? So do you think between 25,000 naira and 200,000 naira, do you think that anything uh, will change in his relationship with people in the village? Nothing. Instead, what will change? Himself. And what is consuming. Then they now say, look, he had connection and he did exams and he got into LNG. First salary, 500,000 naira. Then he now discovered that his colleagues are going to Dubai on holidays. <laughs> Do you think he remembers the village? Yeah. Actually, from what I'm told, Gregory, the auditor, told me that actually, just as he was owing Meaning the money is not enough when he was getting 25 taron. When he started getting 60 taron, he's still owing. When he started getting 200 taron, he's owing. When he started getting 500 taron, he's still owing. Because he's spending more than what he gets each month. Gregory, are you not the one who told me that? Yeah. Greed. <laughs> so, since he's spending more than his salary, will there be anything left to help people? No. Between the time he's getting 25 taron and getting... 500,000, maybe only two, three years, he is not helping anybody. Instead, he's spending it all on himself. That's the kind of person that is still fool, idiot, a la Corey. <laughs> Today, a demand will be made. Somebody had a problem with my using the word fool, foolish in this church before. Jesus, who's, who used it today? No, who used it today in today's church? Fool, this very day, your soul will be demanded of you. People who live like that are already dead. Their lives are empty and meaningless on account of their selfishness. Not to care about others, I think it's Chichi who said that before. Not to care about others is to be already dead and buried alive. See the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. Verse 11 to 31. Instead of getting involved in the dispute between two brothers, Jesus focused on the cause of the dispute. The real cause of the dispute is called what? Greed. Greed for possessions that has divided the two brothers in the story. Many men and women have died living behind enormous estates. But now and again, driven by greed and envy, the families have been torn apart by the wealth left behind. I don't know, um, uh, Solomon, you can let us know, and, uh, and uh, Funke, let us know, whether some of those first um, republic politicians wh whose cases of property were in court, whether they have even ended now. Because we know that for the past 50 years or 40 years, there are people who made so much money and their children have been in court. And they have remained in court 
and the problem begin to affect their children's children because they are not relating well on account of the property left by their father. At the end of the day, me, I have reflected on these things and I have discovered that the children of the poor, the man who died poor and left children, actually the children often relate better than the ones who left plenty of property. This is the paradox of life. Not all that glitters is gold. I'm not asking you to be poor. I'm just saying that there are hazards to being rich. Do you understand the difference? Aim at being rich, but know that there are hazards. The rich man in Jesus' story had a bumper harvest, which is a good thing. Did I say it's bad to have a bumper harvest? We are all, anybody who is a farmer, he should be looking for a bumper harvest. So what, is, what was his sin? One, can you read? He thought only of himself, ready to use his wealth exclusively for himself. Two, he was attempting to rejoice or celebrate alone. And nobody celebrates alone. If it's a celebration, it has to be social, involve others. Three. I mean, one of us is giving thanks to God today for recovery from surgery. Can he do it alone? Why is he joining us? Why, why is he here? To join, so that people can join him in celebrating. Four. What was three? He hoarded his goods rather than share them. Five. Six. We find meaning in life only by reaching out. His life was limited to what he owned. He talked, his talk was all about himself, his grains, his bands, his possessions, me, myself, and I. His world was seen simply in terms of what he owned. The rich man thought he was self-sufficient. He did not share anything with anyone. Even his conversation was a monologue. He didn't call another person to discuss about his bumper harvest. It was a monologue. He thought he had secured his soul and his uh, uh, future with his many possessions. In his search for happiness, and security, he forgot God. He forgot eternal life. He forgot the poor. The rich man was simply a fool, <coughs> an idiot. He was already a dead man. He got his priorities wrong. He did not understand life's ultimate purpose. And sadly, we have met many such idiots and fools around us. He got his priorities wrong. He did not understand life's ultimate purpose. He did not know what gives life meaning. So, his life was an exercise in vanity. Such a man dies twice. He dies on account of greed, and he dies again when his soul is demanded of him. We were created by God, a God who shares his life. God's abundance moves out to others. In contrast to the rich fool, Jesus spends his whole life for others. His love and his wisdom, his body and his spirit, his energy and his prayers, his stories and his imagination. Jesus keeps nothing to himself because he regards nothing as his own. He recognizes that everything comes from the Father. Jesus does not want his followers to live such purposeless lives as the rich fool, buried in the false security of wealth and possessions while real life passes them by. The wealth that Jesus bestows does not divide brother from brother. The real wealth of Jesus is one that we must give away so that we may be rich in the sight of God. Giving away our wealth and our very lives is what makes us rich in the sight of God. Real wealth is not in possessions, but in enjoyment of interior peace. Many people have lost their capacity to enjoy life because they have to acquire ever newer and ever more expensive gadgets. You see, 
what greed, whatever it does, is rob human beings of being able to live in the present moment. And it is only when people are living in the present moment that they can enjoy. You can't enjoy tomorrow. You can only enjoy now. You can't enjoy yesterday. You can't enjoy tomorrow. Can only, but if you are greedy, you are constantly thinking of, I have one million now. How, how I will get 1.5 and 2 million? So you are not living in the moment and you are not enjoying the moment. You are constantly seeking for something of the future. And that robs you of the opportunity of the present. Many are so busy hoarding possessions that they have no time to enjoy the simple things of life the way a child can. Do you see how a child can be preoccupied? It's called a flow. Flow. F-L-O-W. Children are capable of having flow experiences where the child takes his toy and is fully engaged in the toy. Fully, completely. But you will rob that child of that joy when you fill his room with too many toys. What happens? He drop, takes this one, drops it, takes another. Have you seen children in the supermarket? Huh? Little toddlers. Have you seen how they behave in the supermarket? Oh no, it's punishment. It's like punishment. Because the child is going from one thing to the other, picking another and so on. At the end of the day, he doesn't really enjoy it. But if you give one nice toy, the toy that is his choice to the child, he can be preoccupied with it. Come and eat. The child may not be ready to eat because he's enjoying a flow. But take that same child to the supermarket where there are a thousand toys. And you rob the child of that joy. Because, I mean, because he wants this. Mommy, I want this. You know, I want this too. I want this too. Can't I have this? And so on. That is how many of us adults are too. And we miss the joy of life. Greed is like fire. Can we say that together? Greed is like fire. The more wood you pile on it, the hungrier the fire gets. Again, greed is like fire. The more wood you pile on it, the hungrier it gets. So one of the biggest problems of our age is that people do not know when they are well off. I was saying last night at our workshop last night, I said, the average middle class today, middle class, I mean middle class like Virginia, middle class like uh, Evelyn, middle class like uh, the middle class like, uh, the average middle class today, they are living better than kings and emperors lived 500 years ago. I hope you know that. Kings, emperors, they did not have air conditioner. So if it was hot, it was hot. They sweated it out. They didn't have electricity. They used oil lamps or whatever kind of lamps. They didn't have motor cars. They didn't have, in fact, they, did they have mobile phone? Did they have television? All these things have come in the last 100 years old. So, king, including Solomon, and all the riches that they are talking about, they didn't enjoy as much as Chidibere is enjoying today. <laughs> but the problem is, the problem is that we do not know that we are rich. We do not know that we are well off. And that's a serious issue. One of the biggest problems today is that when people are well off, they don't know they are well off because there are other people more well off. Can you see the problem? Yeah. There are other people more well off and they are seeing it on social media, they are seeing it on TV. So, they lose their own celebration of their wealth because they are hearing that there are others. I mean, why should God's time be happy to have a wristwatch when he can see this one that I have displayed? <laughs> right? So, maybe his own is like my own that we got from the streets for those people who are selling on the road. Then when he now see this Rolex, this Rolex that is ten thousand dollars, he just thinks that he has. When we just think that he has no wrist watch. Meanwhile, his own is good. Yeah. 
And Evelyn, where's your bag? <laughs> because when Evelyn sees this kind of bag, she just condemns her own. Meanwhile, her own is not bad, though. But when she sees this type, she just condemns her own. And it's as, it's as if it's nothing. Meanwhile, your own is good enough. Can we all say, mine is good enough? It is not the best. I don't need the best. I just need one that is good enough. All these ladies that are making Yanga here, none of them has anything near the, the shoes that I'm seeing. Oh, yeah, this cheap, this cheap, uh, some of them are bent down the way I'm looking at it. Uh, Christian, is this your own up to 20,000 naira? Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And when you talk of vanity, some of it is about titles. Nigerians like titles, isn't it? And now permit me to humbly welcome the distinguished chairman of this occasion. He is no other person than his Imperial Majesty, Chief the Honorable Sir Engineer Dr. Sam Amihuna of Oriya Bani. <laughs> he is the Onyeke Hihu, the first of Ikaraoro Kingdom. Neko, Diploma, BSc, PGD, MSc, MPhil, PhD, FSS, FSc, CFR, MNI, FLT, JB. And his adorable, amiable, and charming wife, Her Celestial Highness, Lady Chief Architect Dr. Mrs. Precious Oria Bani, the Olowojulo of Etuno and the Iyaigbe of Ikarauru. We like it now, don't we like it? No. Uh, um, well, when they are doing this, eh, the um, the 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 organ will be doing this, and they will be doing this. And the lady, the the lady, well painted, with one inch of eyelashes, uh -huh, and well painted, they will be, will be smiling in, on the chair. Meanwhile, they have just finished quarrelling at home before they came for this. Can we read? Few things are necessary to make a wise man happy, but no amount of material wealth and power or fame and prestige will satisfy a fool. Oh, wait, that one is for me to say. Are you saying it too? Again, few things are necessary to make a wise man happy. But no amount of material wealth and power or fame and prestige will satisfy a fool. I am not a fool. Oh, you two are saying it. We shall know by their fruits. The love of money is the root of all evils. And there are many who pursuing it have wounded, wandered away from the faith and given their souls a number of fatal wounds. First Timothy 6.10. Many people exhaust themselves in the blind and senseless pursuit of material things and die without realizing their spiritual greatness. When we start to distinguish between our wants and our needs, we'll be surprised how little we really need. Jesus asked us not to store up treasures on earth, but to make ourselves rich in the sight of God. And what makes us rich in the sight of God is not what we own, not even what we have done, but who we are. To be rich in the sight of God 
is to enjoy such freedom in this world and live with the uh, assurance of eternal life. The only possessions worth striving for are those that death cannot take away. Can you think about which ones death cannot take away? Which ones can death not take away? Those that endure to eternal life. Vanity of vanities The preacher says it Vanity of vanities All our struggles in All that is of value it's our love for God and neighbor. All that is of value is how much we love. Oh, vanity of vanities. The preacher says it. Vanity of vanities. All our struggles in 